If you're ready, I can give you a quick introduction. Yeah. And then we can get started. Absolutely. Great. Um, all right. Well, thanks everyone for being here. It's 7.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Tonight, we've got uh, Nate Moore, who is from Astro.Build, Astro Build. And Nate Moore is the co-creator and core maintainer of Astro and works on, as a senior software engineer at the Astro Technology Company. Despite his primary focus on developer tooling, Nate's early career as a UI UX designer and web developer instilled in him a deep appreciation for every layer of the stack. As the lead developer of the Astro compiler, which is built in Go and Wasm, he has recently taken an interest in the disruptive potential of WebAssembly in the JavaScript ecosystem. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Nate. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dan, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all about uh, WebAssembly and the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, so I uh, also had a great time at the last meetup with uh, Brian's talk. So uh, that was really great. I'm looking forward to uh, whoever is next up. Um, so yeah, today we're going to chat about WebAssembly, um, specifically in the JavaScript and TypeScript ecosystems. Um, so mostly Node and Deno uh, on the server. That's kind of what I'm into. Um, front end stuff as well. Um, the thing that really excites me is WebAssembly's potential for uh, building tools that were just impossible previously. Um, so we'll take a look at uh, this idea of like hybrid tooling um, and what some folks are doing in this space. Um, so yeah, just a bit of an intro, though Dan uh, really covered it there. Um, I'm Nate Moore. Uh, I work on a project called Astro, uh, which does many things, um, but it is essentially a new tool for uh, building websites uh, in the Node ecosystem um, with the focus on uh, sending very little uh, client-side JavaScript to the browser. Um, I'm a core maintainer of that project. Um, it's a really great team of folks, really awesome community. Uh, see some friendly faces from them uh, in the crowd, which is great. Um, I also was the tech lead on our compiler. So we have a, uh, a special DSL that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and that kind of kicked my interest in WebAssembly off. Um, I've worked on a bunch of other open source projects um, and the Astro Technology Company uh, is also the same folks behind Snowpack. If you heard of that, it was kind of uh, this exciting tool, um, like unbundler um, for kind of like post Webpack, what would a JavaScript bundler look like? Um, and Skypack, which is a CDN. Um, now we're focused entirely on Astro uh, and building that community up. So uh, I'll talk about that a bit uh, at the end of this presentation, but this is mostly uh, just about kind of the ecosystem and what's going on. Um, so to set the stage here, um, there's this idea of like ages in JavaScript, like, uh, and these are kind of popularized by Sean Wang. Uh, the link is here. Um, but this idea is that JavaScript has kind of gone through these growing pains. And right now we're in the third stage of JavaScript growing from this like toy language that's in a browser to this full on app platform. Um, so a lot of the tools during this age are uh, significantly faster than the previous ones. Um, there's this whole uh, migration that has happened from legacy module systems like CommonJS to ESM that's in every browser now. Um, Node is going through those pains right now. Um, and a lot of these tools in this era uh, are doing a lot of things really well instead of doing you know, smaller, one singular focus thing. Um, they're type safe. They're secure. Uh, if that sounds like a good fit for WebAssembly, I think you're right. Um, and they are increasingly not written in JavaScript. So they're actually polyglot projects, um, a lot of them being native, but more and more we're seeing WebAssembly 
uh, take off here. So kind of the quintessential uh, example of this kind of project is ES Build. Uh, if you have seen this before, uh, I know it kind of blew my mind when I first saw it. Um, it's just this fundamental shift for JavaScript developers. So ES Build, if you're unfamiliar, is a, is a bundler for JavaScript for web projects. Um, it's just so much faster <laughs> from uh, all of the predecessors. And uh, its introduction in 2020 uh, was really an impetus for everybody to start exploring, like, what if we don't write our project in JavaScript anymore? Uh, what if we do native or something low level? Um, and I think it's pushed a lot of people to consider that and hopefully turn to WebAssembly. So I think there's this uh, there's this idea out there. If you Google like WebAssembly, you're going to get a ton of articles that are like, oh, the JavaScript killer. Um, I think that that's a lot of hype. Um, there's definitely potential there. I'm not dismissing that. But I think I haven't really seen signs of that happening yet. Um, but I do think people are excited about this idea that like we get to start over with the web and do it right. And we don't have to deal with all that legacy crap. Um, so I think that's exciting. But I don't know that it's actually going to happen, um, at least not in the foreseeable future. So I don't think JavaScript's going anywhere. I think um, you know both technologies play really well together, WebAssembly and JavaScript. And I think the JavaScript ecosystem is slowly becoming more reliant on WebAssembly. It's getting deeper into the roots of everything. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to call out this thing. If you read MDN, like just you're getting into WebAssembly, uh, the very first thing they call out is that it's a different language, but it's not a replacement. Uh, it's a complement for JavaScript. So I think the main takeaway here is like JavaScript is good. WebAssembly is good. You can use the right tool for the right task. Um, and you don't need to try to fit everything into this narrative. Um, so I think some of the characteristics of both that it makes sense that they work together. Uh, JavaScript's a very high level thing. There's no compilation step. Uh, you just run it right in the browser. Um, it's a dynamic language, so it's really flexible, expressive. Um, and the JavaScript ecosystem, for all of its warts, uh, is also really good. <laughs> um, there are a ton of awesome packages uh, in Node, and I think more and more Deno, um, which is where a lot of this innovation is happening. Uh, on the other hand, WebAssembly is this low-level thing. Uh, it's usually not going to be handwritten. You're going to compile to it. Um, it has incredible performance characteristics. So that's something you'll see kind of in all the examples we look at. Um, they are so much faster <laughs> than all the you know, alternatives, um, which for a JavaScript developer is like this mind blowing thing that we're not used to that tools can be that fast. Um, so uh, the other big thing is portability. So. You can have a WASM file, and you can take it anywhere. It's going to run in Node, Deno, browsers. Uh, there's increasingly you know, runtimes that will just run your WebAssembly file, which is so cool. Um, so if you write in WebAssembly, you can kind of take it anywhere uh, if your project needs change. So I like to kind of think about this as like hybrid tooling uh, that takes advantage of you know, JavaScript and WebAssembly strengths. Um, so I would say, for the most part, these, uh, you know, play to both strengths uh, for both languages. So on the surface level, it's just going to be a regular JavaScript module uh, that you'd use like anything else. Um, and that's awesome, because it's really seamless. Uh, it's user friendly, and it's super approachable. Um, it's basically an NPM install away. Um, and, you know, that's a really low barrier. Uh, and it's what JavaScript developers are used to. Um, 
So you might not even realize that that tool is also using WebAssembly uh, internally for some low-level things within it. Um, that uh, is really exciting. You can focus on like computationally expensive things and send that to WebAssembly and have the great performance characteristics, all of that stuff. Um, there's some other benefits to this, uh, but like everything, there's kind of trade-offs here. So the benefits are you're building on web standards that are not going to go away. Uh, you know, you have this single output, which is great and portable. Um, you have shared primitives. So for JavaScript tools, you can, you know, pass data uh, between the layers um, being portable. One that's super exciting to me is gaps in ecosystems are really easy to fill. Um, so if you have, you know, a package that you love in Go um, and you don't, see a package that is as high quality in JavaScript, you can just port it to WebAssembly and use it in your JavaScript. Um, it's pretty incredible. I think there's definitely trade-offs too. Um, you know, it's kind of a new workflow for a lot of people uh, that can push you out of your comfort zone. Uh, a lot of the tooling, we are just saying like, this whole WebAssembly thing is moving pretty slow. Um, and it kind of is. The, a lot of the tools are pretty young. I think Rust is like really invested in this, which is so awesome to see. Um, Rust specifically very invested in node compatibility and like WebAssembly compiling with node bindings. Uh, like that is not an idea in any other language. So that's really cool to see. Um, I think the performance aspects are something that are still being worked out. So. Near native, it's not the same as native. It's a little bit slower, um, but those are kind of solvable problems. Um, the other thing, uh, in my day job, I'm working on open source. So uh, that overhead of working in WebAssembly is a bit of a concern as well. Uh, are you going to be able to attract contributors? Are they going to be able to switch contexts between like, you know, your JavaScript front end and your WebAssembly back end, all that kind of stuff? Um, but that's kind of enough for background. I really am excited to talk about some examples here of uh, projects that are just killing it in the WebAssembly space and uh, are really great examples of what I think of as hybrid tools. So ES build is kind of the big one. Um, it's the one I mentioned up front. You're going to see this chart again. Uh, it just kind of blew everyone's mind when it came out. Um, so it's written in Go, um, and it basically is fully featured uh, in terms of a JavaScript bundler. Um, you know, it's got parsing, compiling for JavaScript, uh, CSS, all those things. Um, and it's being used in the JavaScript ecosystem as this really low-level tool for most projects. Um, so it's actually, if you're familiar with Vite, um, which is a a whole other project that we won't get into here, but they're using uh, ES build under the hood. Um, and really interestingly, uh, it is, you know, they have native bindings because uh, that's the author was like purely focused on speed. Um, so the WebAssembly bindings come in when you need to run in a browser context. So Stack Blitz um, is a tool that is wild, uh, and I won't get into it here, but it's basically a browser-based IDE, um, and it automatically selects the WebAssembly version so that all your tools kind of keep working in the browser, uh, which is really neat. Uh, I think, importantly, uh, I'm kind of calling this a success for WebAssembly, but uh, if you're into Node, uh, there are some specific issues that Evan Wallace, the author of VS Build, calls out that like it's a lot slower. Um, there are some reasons for that. Node has some bugs uh, related to WebAssembly. Uh, Go also has a bit further to go in terms of outputting performant WebAssembly. Um, but those all seem like fixable problems to me. Uh, I also I tweeted out this meme. It's the only meme in my talk, but. Uh, one of the things I love about this is 
you know, I, we were kind of looking at ES build and saying like, okay, it's really cool to write a tool in Go and run it in JavaScript. How do we do that? And if you look internally, uh, it's a bunch of native bindings and there's so much logic to, you know, figure out the correct platform, download the right binary, hook it all up so that it runs. And uh, the easiest thing you could do is just say like, well, we're going to run WebAssembly. It runs everywhere. Um, so that's kind of the idea here. That's a huge benefit of WebAssembly. Uh, another super cool project uh, is ES Module Lexer. Um, this is from Guy Bedford. Uh, it is a really, really cool tool. Uh, you can basically throw a bunch of JavaScript strings at it, and it will spit out uh, your imports and your exports. Um, it's really cool. And Guy Bedford is actually involved uh, with the Node project. So some of this is used internally in Node. Um, it's written in C. Uh, it's fully spec compliant, which is super hard to do. Um, so it can extract, you know, static statements, basically anything static analysis, um, this can do that. So if you're trying to create a module graph from a bunch of files on disk, uh, this is a super fast way to do that. Uh, he says it can do, you know, five, millis five milliseconds per megabyte, uh, which is pretty crazy. So um, by comparison, this Angular 1 code base, which is huge, uh, takes this tool five seconds, and it takes the closest JavaScript competitor 100 milliseconds. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, Shiki is a project that uh, does syntax highlighting. So this is actually uh, what this code on the screen is highlighted with. Um, so I actually used WebAssembly to build these slides. Um, but I think this is one of the best examples of WebAssembly's potential. Um, it's the kind of package that would have been impossible before WebAssembly um, because uh, it actually uses TextMate grammars um, to highlight your code. So if you've ever written like a toy language or something, uh, TextMate grammars are these super complex uh, regular expressions. Um, and the semantics are like really specific to this flavor of uh, regular expressions. Um, and it's always been super hard to emulate that in JavaScript. So you would notice on people's websites, their highlighting would not look like it would in an editor because the editors are using this low level library. Um, and for JavaScript, you know, you'd have to use like just regular. JavaScript's built-in regular expressions. Um, so what's cool about this is it runs exactly like uh, Visual Studio Code does, uses the same low-level tools, um, and everything matches perfectly uh, because it's using Onigurama uh, bindings for uh, the TextMate grammars. So that's super cool. Um, another project is Goldmark. Uh, I apologize, I snuck in one of my own projects here. Um, but it is a really fast Markdown compiler for Deno. Um, it's actually a port of, uh, if you're familiar with Hugo, uh, which is a static site generator from the Go ecosystem. Uh, this is what powers Hugo. Um, so Goldmark is the uh, Markdown parser. Uh, it's common mark compliant, which is cool. That's a very hard thing to do. Um, but I think this port specifically that I'm talking about uh, from Go to Deno uh, is a great example of WebAssembly's potential uh, where I can just like, oh, I saw uh, a gap in this ecosystem and I know a package that I really like, but it's written in Go. Uh, I just ported it uh, super easily to Deno using WebAssembly. So um, I think it's really cool that we're in a spot where ecosystems can like cross pollinate now. Um, and you can get people excited about something that can run in the browser or, uh, you know, it's entirely different 
uh, really bringing people from different areas into like we can all get excited about WebAssembly. Um, we even chatted about uh, Astro potentially using this because it is a lot faster than any of the JavaScript uh, options that we have. Uh, and Markdown is really important uh, for our users. So um, if you are specifically into WebAssembly, uh, Deno is a great thing to explore, um, especially if you have kind of balked at Node before. Um, <laughs> So Deno is similar to Node, but it's TypeScript first. It's uh, all in on these web compatibility, uh, like implementing web specs. Um, so there's a ton of really interesting uh, WebAssembly stuff going on in Deno. Um, they're actually, the tool is written mostly in Rust. So it's it's really interesting that there's a lot of like Rust WebAssembly uh, modules in that ecosystem. Um, so I would check it out if you're interested. Um, this is a really cool one. This is more of a new tool. Um, so Parcel CSS um, is, I think, a native tool, but there's definitely WebAssembly bindings. Um, it's written in Rust. This is just kind of an example of what this tool does. So you can pass it uh, this crazy bleeding edge CSS, and it'll give you back, um, based on how you configure it, it'll give you back uh, basically the uh, efficient CSS that's going to work in your browser that you configured. Um, so you know, I don't actually need these prefixes. It'll take them out. Uh, I want to use nesting, but it will uh, automatically figure out that I, I, my browser doesn't support that, so I'm going to output something different. Um, it's a really cool project like that. Uh, something that is very cool about it is it literally uses uh, the same CSS parser crates that Firefox does. So uh, it's actually a browser-grade CSS tool. Um, a lot of the internal things uh, that Mozilla uses are used in this tool. So um, this would have been pretty much impossible without WebAssembly. You'd be uh, emulating things as best as you could, but now you don't have to do that. Um, and even more wild, this one's actually you know four times as fast <laughs> as ES build uh, in terms of CSS. So we just keep getting faster and faster. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, uh, the parcel project itself is a, a really interesting one. They are doing a lot in Rust now. Um, SWC is a Rust-based alternative to Babel. So that's another thing to check out. Um, that is, yeah, just a lot of cool space going on with the parcel project. Um, Astro, I want to spend a bit more time on. Uh, it's kind of the last project we're going to talk about. Um, but it is the project I'm most involved in. Um, and I just kind of wanted to share some context first. So Astro is a static site generator, uh, the way that you would build, uh, you know, a new site on a server um, in the Node ecosystem. So we have our own DSL. Um, so this is a .astro file here. Um, they are basically a server-side template, um, and it contains some uh, data fetching logic up here, um, and then some markup down here. Um, and one of the cool things is that, unlike every other JavaScript framework, uh, which started in the browser and then backported to a server, uh, we are actually super proud to start and end on the server. Um, that's kind of the only focus that we have is writing a really good server-side language. Um, so let's look at this file a little more closely. Um, like I said, we have the front matter uh, up here that does our, it's a bit of JavaScript that you can write uh, to set up your template. And then down here is the actual template. Um, and it's component-based, 
Uh, it's actually a superset of HTML. So the only difference uh, for the most part is that it's case sensitive. So if you're using an uppercase L, that's a component. Uh, otherwise, it would just be an element. Um, so you can import using a JavaScript syntax and then use it like a component. This is really familiar for anyone using like React or Vue or Svelte. Um, so one of the cool things you can do is actually import a React or Vue or Svelte uh, component and run it in an Astro file. So um, you basically can import any of these, just stick it in your template. Uh, and then with this client idle directive, we're going to say, you know, you should load this in the browser as soon as the browser is idle. Um, there are a bunch of other loading directives, but, uh, you know, you can like defer it until it's visible or uh, load it immediately. You can kind of control all that. Um, so that's a really unique thing. I think this is super cool that uh, you don't need to write functions and have any magical exports or anything you can literally just fetch uh and await it and get uh you know your data right there in your template um and then this is very much like react uh you can map over any items that you got from the array uh and then the last cool thing is that we have this style block so this is actually going to apply to everything in this file um, so basically this UL and only that UL, uh, is going to have the color red and every other style is unaffected. Um, so that's a pretty unique thing there. So that was a lot about our, uh, DSL. And there's a reason I talked about it and that's because our compiler, uh, is one of these hybrid tools. Um, the compiler code base is actually written in Go. Um, and the rest is in JavaScript. Um, we lean on WebAssembly here to make compilation really performant, um, but everything else is JavaScript because that's where our contributors are, that's what they know, um, and it's not the bottleneck that compilation is. Um, so that was an important balance for us to keep new contributors interested. Um, we actually have the compiler in a totally separate repo uh, where you don't need to like install Go or even think about it to use Astro. Uh, we get a lot of questions about why we chose Go, um, especially when Rust is, you know, very far ahead in this space. Um, Go is really fast to learn coming from JavaScript, especially. Uh, I got up to speed in a couple weeks. Um, I think it's really quick to prototype ideas in Go. Uh, and this was initially like just an exploration of, you know, what if our files weren't compiled with a JavaScript module? Um, the proximity to ES build was really exciting to us. So there's this really amazing tool that kind of blew everybody's minds. Uh, and that's written in Go. Maybe it'd be a good idea for us to be written in Go as well. Um, what's cool about that is if we ever decide to change and you know, pivot to Deno or something like that. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But if we do, you know, we're not locked into Node uh, itself. And then uh, spec compliance is a really hard thing. So the HTML spec is super complicated. Uh, Go has this awesome standard library that does a lot of that for us. So we could just borrow that um, and not have to worry about it. Um, and I kind of want to end on this note, the ability to communicate between JavaScript and WebAssembly is incredible. Um, it's a trick that we're using in our code base uh, that I haven't seen many other places. So I just kind of wanted to highlight this as one of the things you can do with WebAssembly that you wouldn't be able to do uh, even with native bindings or something like that. So the code that is actually performing this uh, looks a bit like this. Our JavaScript API uh, is pretty simple. We have a transform export uh, and then this uh, async function that processes some styles. So um, we actually have uh, are extracting the styles in Go, uh, which you can see below. And then 
this JavaScript function we're actually going to pass a reference to and then invoke it on the Go side. But it's a promise. So it's asynchronous. Um, we actually have this utility where we can block the uh, code execution on the Go side until that promise resolves. Um, so we actually get out uh, in this very, like, you know, it's idiomatic JavaScript and it's idiomatic Go. Um, and it's, it's just really cool that we can do something like that. Um, so to kind of sum all this up, uh, I would not be frightened that WebAssembly is going to replace JavaScript. Uh, I think the biggest potential here is just the ability to use the best tool for the job, regardless of ecosystem. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> for listening to me blab uh, for half an hour. That was really fun. Um, you can find all these slides at this link. Uh, and all the links to the projects and stuff are in there. Uh, you can click on the slides. There's a PDF as well. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, and underscore more. And uh, if you could check out Astro, that would be amazing as well. It is astro.build uh, is our website. And you can also find us on GitHub uh, with Astro.